extol you in this worship service today. Oh God, there are some of us in this place that knows if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. God, we're not ashamed to admit we don't know where we would be today. God, many of us would still be in our sin if it had not been for you. So God, we say glory to your name today. We worship you. We exalt you. God, we thank you for a wonderful spirit of worship and praise that is in this house. And God, it is not a spirit of worship and praise to any man, any woman, any pastor, any denomination, but God, all praise goes to our God. And God, we pray that you are well pleased with our worship and praise today. God bless your vessel, that your vessel might be used by you. Oh God, I can do absolutely nothing without you. But Lord, with you, all things are possible. Use me like you've never used me before. And God, I pray that we'll give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' precious name, that every heart say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. 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 The choir blessed us with both of those selections today and we thank God for, for using them uh, to minister to us now, I don't know about you but music music touches me anybody ever listen to music and, and the music touches you uh, the music the song speaks to you and it ministers to your soul and I'm telling you uh, sometimes I'm telling you you can come and uh, you can be going through something in your own life. You can come and be dealing with your own challenges. And, and the Lord will speak to your soul through a song. And the song will lift your spirit. The song will encourage you. The song will help you to, to stay on the journey. Amen. Uh, it's my prayer every time I go to church that I don't leave the same way that I came. Amen. 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 Little Max, I want to call your attention, and I'm moving quickly. I want to call your attention back to a portion of the scripture that was read for your hearing. Uh, Matthew chapter 16. Um, what was read was 13 through 20. I want to read 13, 14, and 15. Sound system, that's good. Keep me right there. Amen. 13, 14, and 15. And the King James Version says this. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14. And they said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias or Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets in 15. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? In other words, who do you say I am? Lomax, can I give uh, a pastoral message today? My message is more uh, pastoral uh, today, and I, I believe there's always a little bit of pastoral uh, preaching in most messages, but this one uh, truly is pastoral. I want to share uh, this thought uh, with a question. And the question for this topic or this, this sermon is, do we know who we are? Do we know? who we are. Can you look at your seat partner and repeat that question to them? Do we know who we are? Listen, if you, if, if you don't have a seat partner, somebody sitting in front of you, tap them on the shoulder and say, do we know who we are? If you don't have a seat partner, nobody sitting in front of you, turn behind you and say, do we know who we are? Amen, somebody. Do we, do we, do we know 
who we are. Come on, let's, let's go to work. This particular passage of Scripture is one of the most important passages of Scripture in the Bible. This particular passage of Scripture is one of the most important passages of Scripture within the Holy Writ or the Holy Word of God. Listen, one other important passage of Scripture is John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's an important passage of scripture. But this is an important passage of scripture as well. This passage of scripture tells us who we are and what we can do. I got to say that again. This particular passage of scripture, this particular pericope, Reverend Marcus, tells us who we are and what we can do. This particular passage of scripture tells us the power that is behind the church of Jesus Christ. You're sitting and looking at me strange, but I know what I'm talking about because Jesus says in this passage, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Do you hear me today? The gates of hell shall not prevail. It, it tells us about the power that the church of Jesus Christ has. And it teaches us about the identity of the church and who we are. Are you listening to me, Lomax? If you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do. You can't possibly know what to do if you don't know who you are. But if you know who you are, you know what you can do. And I'm wondering if some of our problem is, is that we really don't know who we are. Because if we really understood who we really are, then I'm here to tell somebody we can do a whole lot more than what we've been doing. Anybody want to say amen right there? If, if, if we know who we are in Jesus Christ, then there's a whole lot more than we can do. Our actions are always a giveaway of our self-perception, how we perceive ourselves. You know, all you have to do is to watch a person. All you have to do is to listen to a person talk. And I'm telling you, they will tell on themselves what they think about themselves who they are and what they believe they can do and what they believe they cannot do. Listen, you can say something altogether different, but I'm here to tell you, actions speak louder than words. Lomax, when you do a contextualization of this particular passage of Scripture, when I talk about a contextualization, you can't just read the few verses, but you got to read what's before the text, then you got to read what's after the text. And sometimes you got to go back a chapter or two, and sometimes you got to fast forward a chapter or two. But when you go to Matthew chapter 15, and you deal with the latter verses of Matthew chapter 15, in a contextual way, Jesus has just finished feeding a hungry multitude. Jesus has just finished feeding them with, with two fish, five barley loaves of bread. The Bible declares that he has fed some 4,000 men, not to mention women and children. It's in the text. You read it when you go home. And right after he feeds the multitude, 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew chapter 16 verse 1, they try to tempt Jesus by saying to Jesus, give us a sign from heaven. In Matthew chapter 16 and 1, Jesus then gives his disciples a lesson using the Pharisees and the Sadducees as he uses a lesson to talk about leaven or he talks about bread. When you read the story of the multitude, the disciples, uh, they collected so much leftovers that it was enough leftovers for each of the 12 disciples to have their own basket. Are you with me, Lomax? But then as you read on, you discover that in haste, the disciples are quick to get in a boat so that they can go over to the other side, that they leave their baskets on the land and just one disciple carries one basket into the boat. Hear me, in Matthew chapter 16, it deals with the bread and it deals with the Pharisees. And hear me, the disciples of Jesus are so hungry on the boat that they can't hear. They can't pay attention to the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach them about the Pharisees and the leaven and the bread. Are you with me? The disciples are so hungry that they cannot receive the message that Jesus is trying to teach them about the Pharisees and the leaven and the bread. So hungry that they missed the message. And Lomax, I'm telling you, you can be so hungry that you're distracted and you cannot receive, catch me, the spiritual message that God is trying to deliver or to deposit in our life. Sometimes I'm telling you, we can miss the spiritual message because we've been distracted by some other things. Hear me, and Jesus gets mad at his disciples. And if you'll read Mark's version of the same account, Mark's version tells us that Jesus gets so mad that he tells his disciples off. He goes off on his disciples and he says to them, how can you have witnessed me feed the multitude? And now here we are in a boat and you left the baskets on the land and you worried and anxious about me having the capacity and the ability to take care of your need and I just finished taking care of the needs of thousands of people at one time. Really what Jesus is saying is, how in the world can you doubt me in this small situation and I just finished blessing you in a major way and you're going to worry about this pimple of a situation that you're dealing with right now. I don't know who I'm talking to, uh, but maybe you're dealing with the circumstance but the Lord is saying that it ain't as big as what I have already brought you through. And you know what I've already done. So don't you sit there and act like I ain't capable. If I've dealt with your major situation, I can deal with your lesser situation. Somebody needs to thank the Lord right now because what you're dealing with is not greater than what God has already done. Hasn't he already done something great in your life? Hasn't he already done something major in your life? And if he's done something great, then when I deal with minor and small things, it ain't nothing for my God to deal with. Lomax, I'm telling you, every time you come up against a situation, every time you come up with a problem, you ought to look at some major that God has done in your life. And you ought to tell yourself, self, if he did it for this, he'll do it for this little thing I'm dealing with. You worried about bread on the boat. 
hungry and worried and I just finished feeding 4,000 men not to mention women and children don't you question my ability to take care of you and I've already been taking care of you are you with me Lomax disciples are worried they're distracted she said no no I've already proven to you that I am who I say that I am. Jesus says in the Mark account, if you only knew who I really was. See, and I wonder if we struggle with that too. If, if you only knew who I really was, if, if you only knew what I really was capable of doing, if you only really knew what my ability was, if you only really knew how much power I really got, then you wouldn't let some situations cause you to doubt who I really am. I don't know who I'm talking to today. Uh, so what Jesus does, I'm still in context, after that Jesus then takes them to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is named after Caesar. He's named after Caesar, therefore you see Caesarea, it's named after Caesar, and then Philippi, it's named after Philip. Are you with me? Caesarea Philippi. Jesus takes them into an area that is under the rule, the reign, and the dominance of the Roman Empire. He takes them into enemy territory. And then he asks the disciples about his identity in enemy territory or in the enemy's land. Something don't seem right. It's almost like Jesus is saying, the one place you ought to know, the one place you need to be certain of who I am is when you're on enemy territory. The one place you ought not doubt my ability, the one place you ought not doubt my power is when you find yourself on enemy territory. Lomax, you looking at me strange. You looking at me like you don't know what enemy territory is. Listen, for some of y'all, enemy territory can be on your job. Listen, when you go to work, you work with people that can't stand you. You work with people that are always digging ditches, setting traps, talking about you behind your back, and then smiling up in your face. The Lord says, the one place you need to make sure that you know who I am is when you are on enemy enemy territory do you hear me Lomax sometime enemy territory can be when you go into the hospital and you got folk operating on you that do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that's all right as long as you say father I stretch my hand to thee. I don't care about this doctor and what he believes. I know in whom I believe and his name is Jesus. Hear me, Lomax. When you go into enemy territory, you got to know who Jesus is. Because if you don't know it, the enemy will make you doubt him. And the enemy will make you turn your back on the Savior. You got to know who he is. Especially when you're on enemy territory Lomax I don't know about you but I know who's in charge I don't know about you but I know who has all power in his hand hear me today I don't know if the Republicans will win this election or not but what I know I know who has all power I know who has all control. Listen, whether it's Democrat or Republican, you need to understand that Democrat or Republic does not have absolute control. Democrat or Republican does not have absolute power. You and I serve a God who has all power in his hands. That who has control. 
That's who I believe in. That's who I'm standing on. That's who I'm trusting in. Listen, it is not the governor of the state of Michigan. My God has all power. It's not the mayor of the city of Detroit. Listen, I'm trusting in my God who has all power and all control. Got to know who has power. Matter of fact, any, any elected officials, will yet the Lord says, the Lord says in his word, whatever power they have, the Bible says that God gave it to them. And hear me, if God can give you some power on this earth, God can take your power away. Don't you tell me God doesn't have all power. He's got all power. Somebody say all power. Lomax. You and I, we got to know how to deal with reputation. We got to know how to deal with reputation. Stay with me. Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? Catch me. Jesus asked them. So as to say, in a common kind of way, Miss Kennedy, what is the word on the street about who I am? Jesus is saying, in a common way, uh, what do the people on the streets say about me? Catch him. That is to suggest that Jesus' disciples have been hanging out with folk other than just the disciples of Jesus Christ. That is to suggest that the disciples of Christ have been hanging out with folk on the street. I don't know why we act like in the church we can't hang out with some people. I don't know why we act like in the church we can't go certain places, but hear me somebody, you can't make me what I'm not. As long as I got a relationship with Jesus, you can't make me drink if I don't drink. You can't make me into a whoremonger if I ain't a whoremonger. You can't make me into a liar if I ain't a liar. I know who my God is, and I can go wherever he sends me. I can go got to stop being so afraid to go certain places and believe that we are above going. So Jesus said, what do the folk on the street say about me? And you can't know what they say if you ain't been hanging with some folk on the street. It's all right to hang with some folk that smoke a little weed as long as you ain't smoking no weed. How they going to hear the gospel if you don't tell them about Jesus Christ? You so afraid to go where they are that they never hear the good news. You have already destined them for hell. The Lord says, tell me who they say that I am. And hear me, I'm talking to some super saints today who believe that you're too holy, you got too much Holy Ghost to go some places. Listen, the devil is a liar. Jesus sat with tax collectors and sinners. You and I can be so fragile to believe that what they do go rub off on us. No, the devil is a liar. I want the gospel to rub off on them. Do you hear me, Lomax? He says, tell me what the word on the street is. Tell me what folks say in the hood. Tell me what some gangbangers are saying. About. Tell me what some prostitutes and fornicators are saying about me. Tell me what they say. Who I am. Uh, who do they say? Who do they say that I am? And catch the word. 
and say, Jesus, the word on the street is that you are John the Baptist. Word on the street, Jesus, is you are Elijah. Word on the street, Jesus, is that you are Jeremiah. And then, Jesus, there's another group that really don't know where to place you, so you're just one of the prophets. Jesus says, tell me what the word on the street is. The answer they give is the perception of others that are not in the church. What they give is the perception of others that has become a rumor of their reputation about the identity of Jesus Christ. Catch me, somebody. Whenever you are up to anything in life, there will always be a perception about who you are. Are you with me? As long as you try to do anything in life, people will have a perception about you. There will be rumors about your reputation. Whenever you try to do anything, whenever you try to do anything positive, whenever you try to do anything that God would have you to do in this life, there will always be perception. There will always be rumor. There will always be a reputation that other people have about you. You don't have to say amen. Just listen to me for a moment. People will always have their perception or their notions and their opinions about who you are. Just like people had perceptions and opinions about who they thought Jesus was. Hear me, somebody, you cannot control nobody else's perception and opinion about you. You don't have no control over that. Let me help somebody who's always worried about what somebody else has said about them. Let me help somebody who is always worried about other people's perception and rumor about them. Listen, if you're going to worry about everybody and what they think about you, their opinion about you, don't you understand? You'll never get no sleep. If you're worried about what everybody's opinion and perception is about you, don't you understand? That's a 24-hour job, seven days a week. If we're going to worry about other people's opinion, we have no control over that. Are you with me? And you've got to be careful of people who say one thing to your face. And then they saw something different behind your back. They act like they're your friends, but really, they ain't your friends. Because I'm here to tell somebody uh, that, that, that you, you got to do like Jesus. Sometimes Jesus said, well, tell me what the people say about me. And they say, some say John the Baptist, or some say Elias, some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And what Jesus said, I ain't worried about what they said anymore. Tell me what you got to say about who I am. That's the real test of friendship. While other people are giving their opinions, while other people are running you down, you need to turn and say to those so-called friends, who do you say? What is it that you got to say about me? Because there's something wrong if you can sit there and listen to other people talk about somebody else and you act like you ain't never going to say a mumbling word. If you know who I am, it's your time to clear your throat and speak up and say, I know who he is. I know who she is. And he or she is not what you said. Are you with me, Lomax? Are you with me? Are you sure you're with me? Lomax, are you aware that we have people who have opinions and perceptions about us individually but let me help somebody 
People have opinions and perceptions about all of us collectively. Let me make it plain. People have perceptions and opinions about our church. Are you with me? Listen, there are some people that say uh, we might be too bougie. There are some people who might say uh, that, that we, like a, we like a high church kind of worship. There are some people who might say, no, nah, they too ghetto. Some people might say, well, they're too carnal. Some people might say, well, they, they really ain't that concerned about ministry. All I'm simply trying to tell you is people have a perception. People have an opinion about us collectively and not just individually. Notice, if you will, the perceptions about Jesus. He's John the Baptist, Elias, one of the prophets. Look, if you will, every perception that they got is about a past hero that is no longer alive. You got to be careful allowing your heroes to be the people of the past that you don't realize that John Wesley said to serve this present age, my calling to fulfill. We got responsibility to the present and where we are. It's good to celebrate our past, but we are not let our present and our future be stuck because of our past. People have perception. People have opinion. Ain't nothing we can do to control people's perceptions and their opinions. Check it. Their perception of Jesus, John the Baptist, Elias, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, their perception of Jesus was wrong. Just because it's somebody else's perception and opinion don't make it right. Many times people's perceptions and opinions are wrong. You don't know me that well. So since you don't know me that well, how can you speak like you know me? Listen, for the people that know you, who have spent time with you, who have invested in you, who have walked with you and have prayed with you, they know who you really, really are. Their opinion of Jesus was wrong. And I'm here to tell somebody, if you want to stop your productivity, if you want to stop your effectiveness, be concerned about everybody's perception. Be concerned about everybody's opinion. And I'm here to tell you, you won't ever get nothing done. You're going to be staying up at night. Walking the floor, biting your nails. Listen, go to bed. Listen, if it ain't right in the first place, why should I be bothered with the wrong perception? Jesus doesn't even deal with it. After he finds out who they say he is, he said, let's move on. Who do you say that I am? Are you with me, Lomax? Listen, I'm, I, I'm done, but can I, can I give you the bullet points? Four things real quick. Do we know who we are? Do we know? I'm looking now at us as a church. This is not individual, but it's collective. Listen, and I'm done. Real quick, four bullets. Do we know who we are? Look, Max, I believe that the church, there are four C's. I believe that our church has to be the first C is creative. Did you hear what I said? We must be creative. Listen, we don't need to be predictable in every situation. But there are some situations that when God uses you, he may not use you like he did in another situation. He'll use you in a different way. Listen, I know I'm right because when you study Jesus and when you study his healing, when you study his miracles, Jesus never healed the same way every time. 
Sometimes he might spit on the ground and put some mud on your eyes. Other times he might lay his hands on you. Other times he might send you to show yourself to the priest. Listen, but he never did the same thing over and over again. There must be creativity. Hear me, Lomax. No ministry should be doing the same thing that you've been doing for 50 years. No ministry should be doing the same thing, the same old way that, you, that you've been doing ever since you joined. You need to understand that God has called us to be creative. You must not try to be like somebody else that served in this capacity 50 years ago. You must allow God to flow through your gifts, through your graces, and through your creativity that he might bless somebody in a different way. Somebody needs to say amen. You don't have to say amen if you don't want to. I know I'm right. Jesus was creative. Somebody say creative. But listen, then the next C is that we have to, we have got to learn to be controversial. We must learn how to be controversial. What you talking about? Listen, Jesus was always causing controversy. Jesus was always causing people to whisper and to begin to talk about what it was that he was teaching and what it was he was preaching. There was always a controversy. But catch me, Lomax, we will never be controversial as long as we do what the culture and the world and the society tells us to do. You and I must understand that whatever we do that causes controversy is steeped in the word of God and the way of God. We must do what God says do, how God said do it. And I declare that when you do things God's way, you're going to cause controversy. You ain't going to fit in with everybody. Are you with me, Lomax? Listen to me. Everybody is welcome in this church. But catch me. Everybody ain't going to want to come to this church. Because this is a church that stands on the word of God. And this is a church that doesn't mind biblical Bible controversy. Somebody say controversy. Because Lomax, I'm telling you sometimes what happens is. We don't want to hurt nobody. So what happens is we kind of go along to get along. But you don't see that in the word of God. Jesus, everywhere he goes, there's controversy that follows him, Nicole, every place he goes. God is saying it's time to allow some controversy, some biblical Bible controversy that stands on the word of God. You don't have to say amen. I say man myself, amen, amen, amen. Catch my third C, controversial, creative. My third C is we have to be, catch me, consistent with whatever we do. You hear me? You hear me? We, catch me, catch me, catch me. I said we, that's the plural. That's, I'm not saying you, but I said we must remain consistent in everything that we do. Somebody say consistent. Consistent just simply says that when you do it this way, then you need to do it this way for somebody else. Consistency says I don't do it this way for you. And then I do it another way for somebody that I like. Are you with me? We, we must be consistent. Somebody say consistent. In everything that we do. Can I tell you another word that is a good word that is uh, married to consistency? Uh, Pat, is your nasty word. It's, it's commitment. When you say consistency, Benjamin, really what you're saying is that you are committed. Because hear me, you can't make me believe that people are committed who are inconsistent. 
Are you with me? See, the only way to be really committed is you got to really be consistent, not some of the time, but all of the time. You got to be consistent. Somebody say consistent. Because hear me, I just believe that God honors consistency. I just believe that the God that we serve honors real commitment. And I believe maybe the reason we don't see God move like we really want God to move is because God peeps our card and God says, you really ain't committed in the first place. Why should I do it if you ain't really all in in the first? Why should I open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings you don't have room enough to receive and you're not committed to me in the first place? You ain't committed to me. Catch me, Lomax. I'm still on. Consistent in commitment. Listen, he said, you ain't committed to me. He says, are you committed to me in your ministry and in your service? Are you consistent and committed to me in your ministry? Are you with me? Are you committed and consistent when it comes to your giving? How is your consistency and your commitment to me? Listen, all the Lord is saying, listen, when you say you're going to do something, do what you said you're going to do. Because God knows what we said. See, you, it, to be consistent, you have to be committed. Can I give you another one? Are you consistent? Are you committed in coming to church? Or do you come sometimes? And then most of the time you don't come. Hear me. Jesus is dealing with consistency. Jesus is dealing with commitment. And I'm telling you, the Lord is saying that if you will be consistent and committed to me, that I will be committed toward you. But if you ain't committed towards me, I can't come when I want to come. I come because I know who the one is that woke me up. Listen, I understand when you're sick. I understand when I'm sick. But listen, I'm talking about being committed where you don't make a decision on a Sunday morning on whether or not you come into church. Is there anybody here you made the decision about coming to church a long time ago? You said as long as he wakes me up, as long as I'm feeling good, I'm going to the house of God. You said years ago that Sunday is going to be the day that you get your rusty, dusty, up out of that bed and you go to God's house and worship with the people of God. You decided a long time ago that you will worship, you will reverence, you will exalt the Lord on a Sunday morning. I can't go play golf. I can't go play tennis. I can't go to a football game, a basketball game. I might go after church. But listen, and when I'm in a pinch, when my back is up against the wall, you call the lions. When I'm in trouble you call the pistons when i'm in trouble you call somebody else but i know that when i'm in trouble i can call on the name of jesus anybody know that you can call on him anybody know that you can call on him somebody knows what they're talking about because you called on him he came to your aid. He came to your rescue. I, I'm, I'm done. I can't give you this fourth one like I want to. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, listen. <laughs> Lily, you can vouch for me. You know I'm going to the gym. <laughs> but it ain't, but it ain't kicked in yet. Uh, I, 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 I ain't got my full win uh, just yet, Tanisha. Uh, uh, but hear me, my fourth C, my fourth C, my fourth C is that the church must learn to be a little crazy sometimes. 
Catch me, somebody. Uh, my fourth C is we got to be, we got to be a little crazy. All, all I simply mean is when you and I examine and assess the facts, the facts are the facts. Ain't nobody lying about what the facts or the reality really is. Listen, you know that there are some situations in your life. Ain't nobody made it up. You're not delusional. Uh, but listen, you know what the facts are. But when you are crazy, you look at the facts and you say, but I have a God. I have a God that if I can get in it, I'm crazy enough to believe that God can get me out of it. Anybody crazy in here today? I'm crazy enough to believe that I can speak and demons have got to flee. I'm crazy enough to believe that all we got to do is lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Can you lay your hands on your son? Can you lay your hands on your daughter? Can you lay your hands on your spouse? Can you lay your hands on somebody besides yourself? Crazy enough to believe that I serve a God whose name is Jesus. I serve a God who's able to do any and everything but fail. Do I have anybody who's crazy for the Lord? Anybody in here you believe the Bible or the word of God has to say? You can see the facts, but you still got faith. And I'm going to tell somebody that when you're crazy, folk can know that you're broke, but you're still giving to God. When you are crazy, folk can know that you're sick, but you're still running around the church. When you are crazy, you can just have lost a loved one to death, but you can still lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. Because when it comes to my Savior, I get a little crazy. I get a little hot of my mind. Because can't nobody do what the Lord is able to do. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask, think, or listen. You can't even imagine all that my God is able to do. Let the crazy folks say amen. Let folk who got crazy faith say hallelujah. Let those who believe that there is nothing too hard for my God. Let them stand to their feet and give God a hand clap of praise. Let the crazy people say, uh, don't say I'm weak, but say I'm strong. Let the crazy folk say, uh, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. to them that believe. Do you know who you are? Come on, give God a big hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. While you remain on your feet, while you remain on your feet, while you remain on your feet, God, we thank you for your word today. Your word, God, which really helps us and challenges us about who we really are. Oh God, we have more power than God we have witnessed and that we've seen. Oh God, help us to know that there is nothing that we cannot do with your help. So God, I'm praying right now that as you allow your Holy Spirit to move in this sanctuary up and down every row, oh God, whoever is here, who is ready to answer that question. Who do you say that I am? Oh God, today is somebody's day. God, to declare that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, 
Somebody's salvation is coming into their heart right now. Somebody, God, salvation is coming to their house. Salvation is coming to their family all because of their answer to this question today. God, I pray with you, and I know we've got to get out of here. God, I'm praying with you that somebody right now, somebody would respond to this invitation. God, I'm praying that somebody, that they will forget about other people's perception, other people's opinion of them. Most times it's wrong in the first place. God, I pray that somebody will obey your voice. You have spoken to them. God, listen, let them know it don't matter how long they've been away. They are here today and they have received the word from the Lord today. God, if they're not here for salvation, but Lord, they've been out, they've been away for a while. And today, Lord, they want to be brought back in the right relationship. Today, God, they want to recommit. They want to rededicate their life to you. Whoever I'm speaking to, God, I pray that you'll let them come. God, uh, you are speaking to their heart. Help them to move. Help them not to worry about what other people might say. God, we say it all the time. People don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. So God, help them to make the right choice for Christ. This is our prayer. In Jesus' precious name, oh, let every heart say amen. Everyone who can stand, will you stand? Listen, we're not going to tarry here.